Okay, everybody's silent, so. It's, yeah, it's working. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Good afternoon. Nice to see all of you. Actually, we are uh, happily surprised with um, um, all of you showing up here because we didn't know in advance who was coming to this session, this workshop. Uh, my name is Sandra Den Hamer. I'm the, I'm the director of I Film Museum in Amsterdam, but I sit in front of you as the president of the ACA, which is the European uh, Association of Cinematics. I think uh, there's a very big echo. Is there? Okay. Not nice, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, so this workshop this afternoon, uh, we wanted to focus on the access uh, exhibition and distribution of film he heritage in the 21st century, uh, because there are many new proposals, many new platforms, many new perspectives. And we want to do that in a very interactive way with you. So be prepared to ask your questions, to come up with ideas and proposals. Uh, the program of today is very simple. First, we have a keynote by Nina Gosler from Arte. Um, she will explain how broadcasters can work with archives. She will be introduced by Ellen Harrington, who is the director of the Deutsches Film Institute and Deutsches Film Museum. Then after that, we will go into uh, Europeana and the European Film Gateway, which was started as the very first project uh, that we as archives work together on an online platform. That will be introduced by Kerstin Held, uh, uh, representing Europeana and European Film Gateway here. Then we will have Camille Blot, Wellens and Mariona Bruzza, who will talk about I Media Cities. And then it's a break. Then we have Leontine Bout talking about orphans. And we have Thomas Christensen ending this session as an, a kind of workshop, very interactive with proposals and questions to all of you. So be prepared, <laughs> listen well, and think of what you want to ask in the end. Um, <laughs> and then now I would like to give the word to Ellen to introduce Nina to us. Thank you. So I am introducing Nina Gosler, but um, the expression that I'm introducing someone who needs no introduction is very true. I think for this room especially, almost all of you know her, most of you have worked with her. And um, when the executive committee of ACA was thinking of someone whose career has inspired us and could start this conversation about the future of archiving and how we share our content in the 21st century and the digital age, Nina came to mind. She is a longtime uh, program director for Arta, working in um, presenting primarily silent film, but doing a lot of collaborations with archives, restoring films, and then determining the best music for them and commissioning musical scores. She has fantastic musical knowledge, as well as film archiving knowledge. And many of us, she is our first phone call. We really depend on her when we are looking for a way to um, get a film restored, to have a screenable copy with new music, and to have it air on television. And so she has been pioneering this for a very long time. She's also done tremendous programming in um, recently with Kino Varieté and um, touring programs uh, throughout Germany in that category. And um, so I, we asked her to come and give us a little bit of a sense of the landscape for her now, the challenges she's facing, and what we can all do in the future to um, keep the pipeline alive and to adapt because things are changing so quickly. We don't really have any choice. We have to be chameleons and adapt as much as possible to keep our work in front of the public. So um, with that, I'm going to sit back down and turn things over to Nina Gosler. Thank you, Nina. Yeah. Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, coming here as a um, colleague from the TV, um, I open up with a quite negative statement, I must say, because uh, in the very end, it's us from TV approaching or seeking the contact to the archives because I think that film as an art form is very much declining on TV. And therefore, don't be surprised that the first page of my little speech here may sound a bit negatively. 
I don't want to spoil your good spirit here, because for me it's always enriching being here in Bologna, but returning back to TV tells me a different truth. Okay, so thank you for uh, the invitation to this, work, uh, to this workshop. Um, and it's, of course, very necessary to develop new strategies for presentation of film history, but I would better speak of film culture. Uh, because it concerns all of us, uh, not only archivists, but also people uh, dealing with contemporary film. And I'm speaking here as a representative of Arte. I think it's not necessary to introduce this channel, but Arte is still the only channel that has a silent film slot permanently and that maintains cultural partnerships with film archives as Cinematique Francaise or Deutsche Kinematique. And with this policy, Arte is really alone now because um, there was a tremendous change. And what was taken for granted 25 years ago, namely the present of film history in public television has completely changed. Television of today wants to be very much up to date and tries to look modern at any price so that the slower narrative rhythm of historical films acts like a retarding moment in the program of broadcasters. They compete for the attention of the audience. And their mission, if we look closely, is no longer to portray cultural diversity, but to produce political common sense. In addition, the concept of classic film seems to have been largely devalued. Television no longer sees itself obliged to convey a canon of film history. The fatal thing about this development is that the TV audience is systematically weaned of film history and primarily trained in the film language of an American-dominated entertainment cinema, since fewer and fewer films from Eastern Europe, South America, Japan, and Scandinavia uh, can be seen with the exception of crime series. This change is a symptom of the crisis in which cinema, the film market as a whole, and many institutions that are concerned with film find themselves. Archives financed by public funds are coming under increasing pressure to legitimize their work with growing audience rates. On the one hand, large support packages for digitization are being set up, but expectations are correspondingly high that the restored films will not be presented in archive cinemas, but also made accessible to a larger audience. And here, with the film rights, another problem comes into the play, commercial exploitation, in which the archives are involved in very few cases. What is, profitable, what, what is profitable is published without a significant financial participation of the archives. Film without great profit prospects remain lying and are thus devalued. The unknown becomes even less known. The market for film history is very narrow, apart from special publishers such as Criterion, Lobster Film, or Absolute Media in Germany, almost only archive labels offer films that are important for film history. There is not much money to be made with film history. It's a niche product that needs increased efforts to reach its audience. Nevertheless, there are great examples of innovative digital archival work, such as the European Film Gateway, initiated by ACE. It's a great film library uh, with its focus to the years of 1914 to 18 and offers wonderful research functions for people who know what they are looking for. However, in the majority, these are no feature, or, uh, feature films or classical films of film history, but smaller formats, such as weekly news, commercials, and documentary films. It would now be really desirable not only to continue this page, but also to add further decades and fictional films. But sometimes crises have something good. 
we look for new allies who have similar interests and needs. Because we, being interested as film as an art form, historic as well as contemporary films, are in the same boat and have a similar problem to get funds for film restoration or television time for cineastic films, no matter whether we are archivists, television editors, or independent film producers. In favor of film culture, we must find new ways of institutional cooperation and reflect on issues that have been postponed so far. Perhaps this workshop is a turning point here. Politicians, in any case, do not reflect these things, but they draw the money away um, because we did not recognize the signs of the times and thought our positions were secure in traditional institutions. When we think about strategies for archive work in the future, we discuss questions that are all interlinked. We talk first about the pressure of effective public relation work in the archives, because this is now an imperative of the politics. We are talking second about content and the question of how film history can be distributed. And we are talking third about financing models because every form of publication needs money. Money for digitization of films as well as for editorial support. I think this, it's necessary to think really big and to find new corporations. And here again, art may come into the play as a broadcaster that can claim to offer still the most diverse film program on public TV. First of all, an explanation of terms that is important for our discussion, namely what ARTE means. ARTE is an acronym and has nothing to do with art, as many people think. But it just results from Association Relative à la Télévision Européenne. That means Association for European Television. The acronym thus describes, first of all, a, co uh, a cooperation of various broadcaster stations in France and Germany for the development of a cultural channel in Europe. And it's precisely in this sense that Arte has developed its profile, away from the aesthetic and partly avant-garde cultural program of the first years towards a European program, which functions quite well on a political level. Many investments for the linear TV program as well as for the internet are derived from this impact of Europe. One of the most prominent innovations of Artes Web is the European opera platform Saison Opera Arte in which 22 opera houses of 14 countries take part. Every month, new productions of leading European opera theatres are presented. What makes these productions special is that they are available in six languages, and they have subtitles in French, English, Italian, Spanish, Polish, and German. That means that 70% of the European population can take advantage of the opera platform. The platform could serve as a model of an European film platform, also with regard to the financing of the financing of the different languages by the European community. Over the last 12 years, Arte has built up its own web experience as the program is increasingly being used via media libraries, providing the TV program by 30 days for replay. In addition, films that were broadcasted in dubbed versions can be viewed in their original language with subtitles. Only work has a very high priority at Arte. With this web policy, Arte is reacting to the development that the audience is increasingly segmented into special interest groups. With its European orientation and extensive um, extensive web experience, Arte would be a good partner in an overacting initiative to promote European film history. Another important requirement is the free accessibility of the offer, and here we come to the core problem, the financing of film rights. <clears throat> 
If we were to live in a perfect world, a broadcaster like Arte could use its market position to create, to create an awareness among licenses that the market value of historical films declines even more if they do not remain in the public memory. I admit this is a pious hope, but in the long term I see no other possibilities than for us then to join forces here and to develop a kind of master plan in order to achieve an overall appearance through a combination of television program, low-priced license acquisition and active support from the participating archives. All these three parties were often enough, uh, do often enough work against each other in the film world, but in fact they would benefit from such an alliance. Film producers as licenses, film archivists and publishers in TV and in the web. As already mentioned at the beginning, with the rapid expansion of the media market, the demands on all those involved in the mediation of film history have grown. For research purposes, many film archives and of course EFG offers excellent services, but I guess this is not enough to reach a larger audience. And it's important to think of this audience not living in the metropoles and in the cities with access to film museums or presentations of film festivals as here in Bologna. A curated platform by Europe, uh, for the European film heritage including as many fictional films as possible of the silent and sound film era, could become a new home for films that fall through the grid of commercial exploitation. And this applies above all to the historical arthouse film, which as at best is often, is often scattered on VOD platforms and thus hardly noticed anymore. Nowadays, it can only be found sporadically in TV programs. We have a mission to keep the audiovisual heritage alive. The good archives and film museums have always been committed to a cinematic spirit. They don't musealize their film stock, but have always managed to convey the presence of film history. Hopefully, there is a future in this modern spirit. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nina. That's an open invitation <laughs> yeah. to us, and I think we gladly accept. We have a mission. Um, there are many questions, but I think I want to open to the audience. Is there somebody of you who uh, wants to ask a question? Anna has the microphone. Oh, no, not, not Anna, but... Uh, yeah. No, what I just pointed, wanted to point out, maybe it's easier to explain it condensely. In the very end, it's a political problem, because due to the political pressure that we have to legitimize whatever we do, and this political pressure is really high now in TV, you can't imagine how important this... Uh, no, not how annoying yeah, this discussion about daily audience rates is. It really spoils the program. Um, and I'm quite convinced if it would be possible to join together and really to act on a political level, one could reduce this pressure. Also, Arte has lost his good cineastic profile and is offering now a lot of American films in the prime time. Uh, everything that is cineastic is hidden after midnight. It's everywhere the same problem. And um, we as editors on the base, let's say, we have a very open discussion, but we don't succeed in to convince our program director, for instance, yeah, that he has to change his policy. And also Arte is doing just the minimum to fulfill some kind of cultural partnerships, 
uh, okay, there are retrospective of uh, Jean Gabin, of Renoir, uh, mainly French film history, but it's just enough to say, well, listen, we fulfill our duty, and then we go back to the everyday business, yeah. And therefore, I'm quite convinced if it would be possible to join in a different way and to do something that is really unexpected, yeah, and so far there was never a really active collaboration uh, with archives and and uh, us as a cultural channel, I guess um, it would be a chance. Mm -hmm. I know it's very naive, yeah, and uh, but if we think about it clearly, it's um, the reason for all this declination of uh, quality of public TV is uh, politically. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I Maria. Uh, thank you, Nina. I'm Maria from the Greek Film Archive. Uh, just to question, when you say, uh, of course, it's political, but uh, I except from Germany and France, uh, how can other countries belonging to the European Union intervene? Is it through the Ministry of Culture, through European Parliament, and also, if big art films are not shown any longer in Arte, what chance is there for, let's say, restored films or silent films from countries that do not belong to the three or four, let's say, countries like Greece or Albania or um, I don't know. I mean, uh, exactly. I would be very interested. Yeah, to hear I guess thoughts. that. European culture is now the keyword because they are really aware now, yeah, to build up a kind of European platform. This is now a very current discussion. And as we all see, this model and this idea of European unity is completely scattered at the moment. So at least on a cultural level, it should be like a symbolic collaboration between all these countries. And uh, before uh, preparing this uh, speech, I was gathering comments of colleagues uh, when we met in Berlin Film Festival. And uh, this idea of a European culture could be really the, the key word, uh, so that films from Greece, from Yugoslavia, and from uh, especially Eastern Europe have another chance. But it's necessary to um, to expose it on the right political level. And it would be a European community. I can't tell you now what, be, uh, what would be the right administrational uh, department, but I guess this European idea uh, could be a very, very striking argument. Yeah, to add on that, in, um, we started this discussion already in, during the Cannes Film Festival with some of the directors of Cinematex who were there with the head of media from Creative Europe. And actually, Gianluca, of course, did a very nice speech talking about that European culture is really defined by its audiovisual memory. So if we want a European Union and European identity, we should really uh, safeguard our heritage. From that on, she, the lady, who's now head of media, invited us to come up with concrete proposals in autumn. So it's a very good moment to, to start talking about this. And we discussed over lunch with some of our colleagues. Uh, of course, in the end, it's all a question about money, but it's, all, uh, it's also a question about political pressure, indeed, from the European Union towards the member states to make sure that the heritage exists and is accessible. So I think to work together, although indeed for some of the countries, uh, because we always, we can see Arte uh, in the Netherlands, but we don't see Dutch films. But you said we don't approach you, we will now. <laughs> <Yeah. Amsterdam. laughs> From tomorrow, I think other mm. people as well. Mm. Um, any, any other question for the, mo yes, Georgi. Serge. Me? Yeah. 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 Uh, by I'm Serge Bromberg from Lobster Films. Uh, in 1984, uh, Jacques Lang, Minister of Culture, decided that 14% of the income of the new TV channel Canal Plus would go to cinema. By doing this, 
in one decision that took like less than 10 minutes in the office of the President de la République, he literally built 30 years of the most active cinema industry ever. Uh, in 1943, Churchill was told by the Minister of Defense, uh, the Minister of Finances, listen, we have a problem because the effort of war is so enormous that we have to cut all the expenses of culture. And Churchill answered, well, if we have no culture, why are we doing war? <laughs> so uh, my guess is that if today one, the, every politician said to the TV channel, you have to spend half of a percent of your income in cinema culture or cinema promotion, that decision would not cost so much, would take half a minute, and if we don't have that, we may struggle as much as we can, but it's more than ever a political decision from the top. And to tell you the truth, when I see how the financing of cinema in general and classic cinema is melting down today in France, I do not foresee that any politician will ever support the idea that the only way to restore films is, of course, bringing money, but also forcing the broadcasters to show films, to make films in their program. If the Minister of Culture in France and Germany joined forces and said, well, we want every week a classic film on Arte, would it be in the middle of the night we then replay for 30 days? That would make sense to restore films. Because they do not make that decision, we are restoring films because we know it's our duty, and then afterwards we struggle to show them, including you, Nina, of course, yeah. and we know that there is no political intention at all to support that idea. Thank you, Sergi. Uh, Nina, you want to respond to that? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, now, you are completely right. What I forgot a bit is we have with the web, new distribution forms. And so far, um, we made the experience that for the web, no creative impact is possible because the budget is quite limited. So if, we, if it would be possible, uh, I would say. The, one of the most resources is time nowadays, yeah? So uh, maybe it sounds now a bit cynical, but I'm quite optimistic that we could build something really for the web. For TV, I'm afraid it's still very difficult to get better time because yeah, this valuable time resource uh, will not be given away so easily. Yeah, But we could uh, develop, uh, I mean, it's already our discussion between Serge and me, uh, could uh, do something for the web. And there I really see uh, a new chance uh, to go together. But of course, it's also the experience. As soon as you present a film in the TV program, it has a different uh, attention in the web as well. Yeah. yeah. George. Okay. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm George from uh, Budapest, from the Hungarian Film Archive. And I follow this uh, uh, issue uh, since last year. Uh, we were talking about it with Nina, also um, with Sandra and uh, the others, and uh, the other uh, directors of European uh, Cinematheques. And uh, and Serge is right, and uh, but we have to see that too. That uh, I think the Churchill quote is very very important because channels, TV channels, are in war for audience, and uh, we are in another war uh, to preserve our culture. And to find this uh, the common terrain is will be very difficult because uh, because the money uh, counts a lot. Uh, we have to say that Arte is not visible in every. Uh, European country. That's the first point uh, that we have to, to know. For the Hungarian Film Archive to be on uh, on Arte's program, for example, it's good for the for the promotion of the Hungarian cinema, and it's good for the income because Arte pays a lot for uh, for uh, a prime time program. Well, but not only even American a prime time films, program. Yeah? Yeah. So. Um, so it means that the right holders once get, get money from Arte from the first uh, in the first place, uh, and the, the culture issue is coming after. Uh, but 
they are doing that also because Arte is paying a lot for American movies uh, like Terminator 2 or uh, Rumble First Blood, and uh, which are good films, but they are they don't have nothing to do with your European culture except the producer who was Hungarian. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but really uh, that's that's the case, and we have to uh, admit all these uh, difficulties. And I think the, the the point that it must be a political decision which is coming from the top, it's right, and uh, France and Germany is, are the key countries uh, in it, but we have, to, uh, we have to make a statement, a united statement with the EC members, because that's the only way that we can communicate towards Europe, and it's European money which is going to these channels, uh, to this channel, and, uh, and again, I think there is the question of, of visibility too, that uh, why, uh, if it's a European finance channel, why we cannot see that in every European country. Uh, okay, maybe the web can uh, make, give an alternative, and I think it's, uh, it's good to go uh, to the easier way uh, in, in that, and, and uh, European Cinematheques and European Film Archives has the knowledge to propose uh, also uh, curated contents uh, to speak about it, why it's important, their, their films, because we, do, we don't know each other. We know the biggest names, but we don't really know uh, what are the, the, the pairs, uh, hidden pairs of uh, the cinema of our countries. So all these uh, has to be taken under consideration, I think, but I'm very happy to, to uh, have, to see your enthusiasm, and, and I think there's something that can yeah. Maybe happen. No, I think we have to accept your invitation and see this yeah. workshop <laughs> as a new way of institutional cooperation, as you mm -hmm. said, and I think all of us uh, agree to start from there. Um, I think we should move on because then we have mm -hmm. uh, also very practical, hands-on information. Now we start. Thank you, yeah. Nina. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> and actually, some of us have a meeting with Nina tomorrow to see how we can really start working already this year. Uh, now I would like to invite Kerstin Held uh, to present how we all can improve the data that we have on the European Film Gateway. And you will do a presentation. Thank you for the and invitation. You need a and, uh, yeah. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I am Kerstin Held. I'm working at the Deutsches Film Institute and Film Museum as a EU Projects Coordinator. But the hat I'm wearing today here is I represent EFG as uh, aggregator for Europeana. And uh, so I will start. It's a little bit different from the, from the keynote speech that you have heard. It's going to be a little bit technical as well, so don't be afraid. I don't know, um, I suppose most of you already knew the portal, but I will say a few words about it anyway. This is um, my sort of directory for this uh, afternoon. I will tell you a few facts about EFG, the European Publishing Framework, and write statements. Um, so the portal was built from 2008 to 2011. Um, and the most important collection we have is indeed, Nina, the Europe first, first World War collection, but it's not the only one. So it's, uh, we have more than 700,000 objects available, so films, posters, tech doc text documents, photos, etc. cetera. Um, EFG is also the biggest portal for film heritage so far. And of course, it's, it's smaller format. It's not a fe long feature film, but it's documentary films, news reels advertising films, information films. So it's a great resource for researchers and um, yeah, curators. Um, the work we do for EFG is coordinated by the Deutsches Film Institute, but uh, the portal as such is governed by ACE. Um, we have uh, 
I, the, the last big project indeed was uh, the First World War project, which ran from 2012 to 2014. But EFG is still important because it provides still aggregation services for other projects. For example, for the iMedia Cities project, maybe you will talk about this later. And we are still involved in more European projects, for example, Victory, which is uh, a project about the reconstruction of public spaces after the World World War, Second World World War, and how these places shape memories. So the virtual exhibition, which has been built um, for the First World War project, is, will be used also to present the results of the Victory project. Mathieu, you will talk about this, not today, but Tomorrow, tomorrow. Okay, he, Mathieu will tell you more about the Victory project tomorrow. So, and still, we are still involved uh, um, in other projects, so EFG is an important source for building up new projects on it. Even if we uh, lack a little bit of funding. Um, these are just a few um, examples of collections which are available on EFG. We have more than 150. So this is uh, the partnership. 39 countries are members of the European Film Gateway, including Greece, including, including Macedonia, including the small countries. It's 24 countries, and we provide 21 languages. So, and if you want to join EFG, this is not a presentation, because as I said, I speak um, in my role as uh, aggregator for Europeana. But if you want to join EFG, please talk to me, come to me afterwards, or I'll be around until uh, Thursday. It's, um, it's an important source, and it's quite easy to um, provide content and metadata. So this is the aggregation landscape of Europeana. It's not a very new schema, but uh, in general, it works as it is. So there are domain aggregators like the European Film Gateway, which is for the film heritage domain. You have other domains like um, fashion or um, TV archives. And of course, you have the national aggregators, which provide uh, material from different sectors from one country to Europeana. So our task as aggregator is, so we do, of course, enrichment of data. This is one of the, f is the main focus of the Euro Commission. That's why we are funded for, that's where the money goes to, it's data quality enrichment. So this is nothing which we can influence. There was a, three years ago, a kind of inquiry, a survey among stakeholders, and the recommendation was that Europeana has to improve its data. But uh, apart from this, we also do um, advocacy. Since a couple of years, the aggregators are the joint in a forum. We have a seat in the experts group of digital heritage not as a counterpart to the Europeana Foundation, but we wanted to speak with an own voice. So our problem is, and that's, that's true for all the aggregators, we lack of money. So we get very few funding from Europeana or from the Commission via Europeana, which really goes into this data quality enrichment. I think five years ago, we got more funding, which we could distribute also to our partners for curation, but this money is no longer existing. So. If there's money on national level, more money than ever, for the European level, we are really cut. Another task is to connect five new partners to the portal. So I would like to invite you to uh, talk to me, or if you're interested, it's um, to join. I can also uh, give you my card afterwards. If you, you can also talk to our data coordinator, which can tell you how easy it is to contribute to a Europeana and to EFG. Um, the tasks are a little bit shared between uh, DFF and ACE. For example, the organization of this workshop is ACE task, and the promotion of standards and frameworks is also the task of ACE. I'm here to, to help with that. So this is our budget. I'm, we are very transparent about it uh, for this year. So this is for personal costs, as we have seven months. Um, then we have a subcontract for the technical provider who hosts the database, which we have to pay from the personal costs because Europeana does not pay EFG as a portal. 
we subcontract ACE and we have a very ridiculous uh, travel budget. <laughs> But this is, of course, Europeana pays for accommodation, or accommodation, but this is anyway, it's ridiculous. <laughs> so and now I have to go a little bit in the details what, uh, um, what concerns data quality improvement. This is a record, as you can see it on the EFG portal. So you have basic filmographic data. You have a description, a very long in this case. You have key words and so on. You have a um, right statement. It's public domain. This is great. And um, now I wanted to tell you what uh, we do or what our da data coordinator does to improve these um, data. So this is the Europeana publishing framework for, for content. This is for images first. So this is pretty much straightforward. You have to provide a minimum your images at 800 pics. And your metadata have to have a, a direct link to the object. For the previews, it's 400, and uh, I think for the videos, it's 480 by 720. So this is the minimum you have to provide for the content. And the content is, um, the publishing framework for content is not new. Um, and you had to see these uh, four tiers. So most of the content of EFG is tier two and tier three. Tier three would mean that you have a a right statement attached to this object which would allow non-commercial reuse and tier four is only for these objects which you can freely reuse which is necessary if you want to provide your make your collection um, accessible on wiki via wikimedia they require a free re reuse license what is new is the publishing framework for metadata so this is this exists since a couple of months. Um, and the, as I said, the main requirement from the Commission is data quality enrichment and also multilinguality. So, and there are two ways to uh, improve that, especially multilinguality. So you, I tell you what, what you can do as a partner, and I don't know how many uh, EFG partners are in this room. Okay, oh. at least a few. <laughs> Thank you. Good to know that there are many new faces here. Sorry, but then you have to go through this as well. Um, so you can uh, improve multilinguality by providing language attributes, which is very easy. So just have these are, for example, you put in, in, for in this is an XML export. Um, from EFG to Europeana. There are a few fields for which you have to provide this um, language attributes, not for every record, but for only for these four, which is description, keywords, title, and alternative title. <coughs> and you can either provide these um, language attributes in an Excel file or in your exports. And I asked um, Eleonore whether this would be necessary for the legacy data as well, and she said, mm, yes, would be nice. I don't know what, how much work this would mean for you to, um, to do this. But it's definitely important for any new contributions. So, and this is what we at DIFF do to enrich data. So um, we provide an LOD link to Europeana. This is only possible in cases where there is a controlled vocabulary, which you have in EFG for genres and places. So and this first link uh, leads you, I can show it to you, put it here. The first link leads you to this uh, vocabulary, which means um, documentary films, but I cannot see it. Why not? Uh, you can guess it. It says documentary film here. I mean, you can see a little bit. Ah, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, is my day presentation. Ha. 
Where is my presentation? Gone, lost. On the desktop somewhere. Okay. Yeah? Oops. Okay. Ah. Yes. Ah, so. Okay. This is correct. And now I have to put F5 for full screen, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, maybe you don't follow this link. So the first one is, is for documentary films. The second one is for um, leads you to uh, moving images, and the third one to geo names. And this geo name would, would be Italy. So um, I tried again. So if you if you look at the record in the Europeana collection site for the same title, you will find uh, more extensive information. So. This is, <coughs> this is the Europeana website. <coughs> so for those who don't know how this aggregation works, the content which is made available on Europeana can also be accessed via, uh, which is available on EFG, can also be accessed via the Europeana portal. So here you have this GU name, Italy, the place, I mean Italy, and then when, if you click here, ah. We're in the wrong city. The wrong city. It says Torino. <laughs> yeah, but this is uh, this is a uh, this is fake because it really sa only says Italy. I don't know where they've put this uh, point here. Okay. So, Dove, I don't know. So here you can see Italy. This is the LOD vocabulary for Italy in all these nice, un in um, countless languages. But this is improvement of multilinguality, and this is why we do this workaround. We provide these links to um, Europeana. It's a bit complicated. So, and why don't we do this directly in EFG? Because we can't. So, LOD, um, so DFF delivers to Europeana these links to vocabularies, as I said, only to the controlled ones, that allows Europeana to display them in all these languages. But the EFG data schema as such and also the database are not able to handle LOD. So therefore, if you want this as well, we need to um, adapt the, the database. But we have to do this, as I said, they are really counting. What are you doing? Are you providing your language attributes? Are you providing these links? And then you are, you're, you're, you are rising in the tiers, so your tier is getting higher for your content. So just a brief, sum ah, a, a brief summary, how you can enrich your data, both content and metadata. So please provide language attributes for these for keywords, titles, and descriptions. Provide the content in decent quality. What I said, 400 pics for thumbnails, 800 for images, and 400 one side for videos. And please, 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 please check your broken links. We cannot do this for you, so um, it's so frustrating if the link leads to nowhere. Would be great to do this. So, talking about right statements. Your topic, Leontine? <laughs> um, you, we would like to encourage you to use standardized rights labels. And these are the rights labels from rightstatements.org. Currently, we map the EFG, so your right statements in EFG to these uh, standardized right statements. So if you say, for example, not copyright protected, we say um, public domain. If you say no known copyright of work, we put in the label in copyright EU of work. 
um, if you say in copyright, rights holders unlocatable or unidentifiable, we say it's in copyright. So all these kind of ways to express that you are not sure what rights are attached to this object. So we will match them to one of these uh, right statements. We use all of them apart from the last one. This has not, not yet been used in EFG. So it could be interesting if you want to uh, make your material accessible for education or research. So the last one. So if you use this label in copyright EU orphan work, or we will use this label if you, do, if you say it's an orphan work, you have to register with the European database for orphan work. So this is a requirement. Otherwise, you cannot use this label. Yeah, again, this is not only, I think, using standardized rights statements makes sense not only in the context of EFG or Europeana, but also your local databases maybe, if you don't um, export, to, if you don't um, contribute to EFG. Um, they are only for digital content on platforms and websites, so it's not for, if you are the creator, then you should uh, use a Creative Commons license. Uh, the li right statements are supported by the Digital Library, Digital Public Library of America and Europeana. And they are also easy to apply, but for the time being, we are doing this for the EFG partners. Yeah. These are some useful links. For example, to the metadata schema and vocabulary, you can find it on the EFG project website. The publishing framework as well, but there will be a new one, so it's uh, not the latest version I presented today. And for the right statements, it's the right statements.org website. Yeah, thank you. So if you have further questions, you can contact us via these uh, email addresses or, as I said, after this meeting or I will be around these days. All the colleagues from the ACE uh, board. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kirsten, yeah. also make the, uh, the presentation available through our yeah. uh, ACE website. Yeah. So if yeah. people want to yeah. approach all the links, yeah. that would be very useful. You, yeah. Ellen. Yes, um, that's exactly what I was going to suggest, is we'll put this on the ACE website. We know a lot of you are not responsible for putting up this information or maintaining these links, but we will also create um, a very easy manual that we will email around to the membership so that everyone who's actually responsible for uploading your content is getting this new information with all the links and all the contact information. And then tomorrow, for those of you in the General Assembly, at the ASEA, we'll be talking about what are the future options for maintaining this platform, which of your institutions are using it most often, who isn't really using it, and how can we all um, make sure that it, su it survives, essentially, so that some of these other projects you'll hear about in a few minutes can continue to use the technical capacities that have been built up by EFG in order to do more European projects. So. Um, Stay tuned for emails and updates on the ACE website. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Any, any urgent questions now? Leontine. I, I, I just want to add something, if I may. That's sure. Like <laughs> yeah. 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 Good news for you. Good news for EFG, I think, is that the new digital single market directive, which yeah. gives um, out of commerce. Yeah, works. that's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, that's I've been there last week for a meeting, but it was no time here to present it. But of okay. course, maybe you can. Yeah, I'm jumping ahead of my yeah, presentation very later. Yeah, but uh, yeah. I think there will be really good news yeah, it's for your team. Mm. Uh, yeah. there's, there's some caveats that I will mm. uh, address later, but that good. should give you the option yeah. to have loads more films on there with no problem. Yeah, maybe. But then we still have to put them on. That's the first. Uh, yes, you have to put yes. them on. Well, so the good, the good mm. news is that, direction, that directive also gives those countries who do not have a preservation exception in their copyright law a, a mandatory, um, hmm. like Germany, you don't have that now? But you're we gonna have a preservation exception. But you're going to get a better one maybe now. Ah. <laughs> but we have no uh, have CMO no okay. for films. Okay. 
Okay, but, the, but that's good news. Uh, yeah, I know. I'll tell you later. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe a one word about why this just came up when I heard the um, pre presentation or the keynote from uh, Nina why a European Film Gateway. I'm aware you have all great national portals, maybe better functionalities, but this is also to have uh, the European perspective. If you look at the First World War collection, if you have time, you can search for EFG 1914, then you see this is a, such an a, important event and you have really the perspective of 21 countries, which makes it different from a national perspective only, just to speak for Europe. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now I will invite Camille blot Wellens and uh, Mariona Bruzzo to talk about iMedia Media Cities. And so far, as they say, we talk about content, but they want to talk about materiality and physicality and 16 millimeter and where <laughs> to find all that on the platforms online. Yeah, so I will uh, introduce ourselves a little bit while Mariona is uh, preparing the, the presentation. Um, so Mariona Brusso is uh, the head of the cent uh, conservation center of the Filmoteca de Catalunya. Uh, and uh, I'm now independent researcher, but I've been collaborating uh, with uh, I made your city's project uh, for the Swedish Film Institute. So it's, uh, it's, it's a work we have been doing together uh, when I was working for the Swedish Film Institute. So I thank you very much, Asir, for inviting me to join today. Um, and so, yeah, we, at the end of the project, we thought, OK, so what are we transmitting? And it's, uh, we are going to share our thoughts with you. Oops. Uh, well, uh, first, uh, thank, thanks to give uh, us the opportunity to share uh, this, uh, this experience and our point of view as a film archivist that I think sometimes it's really focused on, on make diffus diffu diffusion, uh, but uh, what we really take care is about the films. Um, for a little information about iMedia Cities, uh, was set up by uh, ACE, Association of European Cinematheques, with the aim of generating new waves of approaching the film heritage. The Horizon 2020 program of the European Union would offer the ideal framework for the realization of a project of this nature. And Nicola Mazzanti, the director of uh, Cinematheque Royale of Belgique, and then the president of the ACE, was the person who would be able to mobilize uh, nine film archives to make it real. So, uh, making film heritage. Uh, the nine AC film archives involving nine media cities are Filmoteca de Catalunya. Uh, well, you'll see, uh, you know all of us. Uh, from our film collection, we have participated in developing a digital, sorry, a digital platform to be able to visualize city films with the aim of encouraging research in the humanities field. More than 1,000 films have been incorporated into the platform. They were expressly selected to give meaning to the project. Each city is represented in a singular and general way, allowing similarities and differences to emerge between them. From the film archive's point of view, there are those questions. What does it mean for us to make film heritage available online? Unlike uh, other projects, uh, as uh, Kerstin has uh, talked about, uh, it's really important to show a collection in order to make film heritage more accessible uh, to the audience. So what are the criteria of selection? And what does it mean to work with different film formats and film rates? How can archives transmit their knowledge of the film collection to researchers and common users in order to allow them apprehend the film in its entirety, and not only for its content. That is really important for <laughs> Camilla and I. Even though the digital screen unifies and overshadows its original technical characteristics. So, 
Uh, here is a capture of the iMedia Cities uh, web. Um, the first step is to establish the topic for the project. In this case, the nine cities are their city films where the core of iMedia Cities. Brussels, Frankfurt, Copenhagen, Stockholm, Barcelona, Turin, Bologna, Vienna, and Athens. The city as a concept and its representation were the guide that marked the possible titles candidates. In principle, from the archives, there should not be any filter, or at the, le or, or the least. First, uh, availability. Uh, that is to say that the words were largely digitized in order to facilitate their access and to be able to start the project as soon as possible with our research partners from easily viewable films. When titles that, that were not digitized, sometimes not even preserved, <laughs> appeared, but were of particular interest to the project, the research team was immediately informed to assess the need to incorporate them into the project and digitize them. Another aspect that was taken into account was the representation of the city in relation to the entire film was significant. Face it with the with this situation emerged the problem of the whole and the part. This is from the, uh, <laughs> the, the exhibition of Kubrick that uh, shows in Barcelona. Uh, if a sequence appeared as a small part, although very significant in relation to the city, but only a fragment or a, of a larger work, the option of adding only that part was often discarded, since by detaching itself from the rest of the film, this part lost its context. With this decision, many fiction films were left out of the project, as the cities were represented in a fragmentary way and considering that we are addressing diverse researchers, adding the whole film could confuse them. In the case of actualities, it was often decided to keep the original footage without isolating the news of the city from it. Of course, those relevant to the project had to be significant as a whole, whether in terms of quantity or quality. That the titles chosen were representative in the city as a concept, not only that they had been filmed in it, in it but that they showed it or that they provide an interesting vision of the city. And here you see the, um, well, the, how many um, films and the genres you, you could find. In order to unify a common chronological space, it was agrees, agreed to establish the ban from 18. 90 until 1989, from the period of the demolition of the wall of the walls to the main European cities until the fall of the Berlin Wall, a symbolic time, which is taking a new meaning from the present day. The distribution of the result, resulting final selection in relation to the established period is the result of several factors, from the loss of film heritage in the early cinema to legal issues in the most recent cinema. With the idea of making access to film heritage as agile and easy as possible, the length was another point to take into account. As working on cinematographic works with thousands of shots, sequences, and frames, all replete with collateral and parallel information could stress the tool and make it incapable of managing so much data in a clear way for the future researchers. As you see, well, for here, it's uh, a lot of annotation that appear. Um, so, legal issues. <laughs> uh, the legal status of the work was an important aspect to consider at the time of selection. Initially, all archivists intended to prioritize titles in a public, dom in a public domain in order to create a more homogeneous platform between research, educational, and citizenship since the public domain allow, allows unlimited access to all the contents of the platform. But it was surprising to note that works of this type represent only 15.5% of the final selection. There are several reasons for this. Cinema is a young art, barely 125 years old, and therefore the period of the protection of works between 70 and 80 years after the disappearance of the last author is still in force. But the archives also preserve relatively few works from the first years of the cinema, as a large part of this 
heritage has been lost. In relation to the orphan works, which represent as an, impo an, an important part of the collection of the European archives, approximately 20%, and for which we have obtained from the European Commission the possibility of preserving and even promoting the, them after registering them legally, orphan works at a base of the European Union Intellectual Property Office, <laughs> they are curiously almost absent from the project, just 0.5%. Uh, this figure makes visible the complexity of the digital, digital diligent research process of registration of this time of wars by film archives. So for the most part, the wars of the platform are protected by the intellectual property law, which protects the rights of authors 80%. Although this proportion varies greatly between archives, it, it's interesting to note that heritage institutions increasingly include protected works, which could mean improved relation between archive and right holders. However, it is important to mention that in some archives, that some archives have the rights to some of the films chosen for the project, like Swedish Film Institute and Filmoteca de Catalunya. Of course, the use of protected works by archives is done within the educational and cultural nonprofit framework established by the European Union. The works may be consulted for research or educational purposes. The iMedia Cities project, very focused on research, allows access through a website with restricted access, but also pursues the possibility of reaching the educational field and promoting general consultation for all citizens curious and interested in this type of platform. Once all the curatorial, curatorial and legal aspects were taken into consideration, the fact that it was a research project project was decisive in creating not only a rich and diverse collection, but also a coherent, a coherent one to allow for transversal and common research themes among the different selections made by the nine archives. For example, it was important not only to try to reach a certain exhaustiveness in terms of time, but also to reach the same production periods in various collections in order to be able to compare the, the cities with, it, with, with each other. Similarly, the presence of various genres, documentaries, new reels, amateur, from different archives have to be ensured in order to achieve more accurate results. Because how can we compare the treatment of certain themes in different cities if we can only compare professional new reels from the 40s made to be screened in cinemas with family films from the 70s in reduced format designed to be screened in the living room at uh, of a house, and it's preci precisely these questions that make emerge the importance of what all the technical characteristics uh, about film heritage explains, and uh, it's about its nature and its materiality. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Because uh, film heritage, you hear me okay? Yeah? Film heritage preserved uh, by the film archive is to a large extent made up of film produced to be screened to an audience in a film theater, but other venue as well. And the way the film was seen through the years and are still seen today is as diverse as it is rich. But as we saw, film archives also preserve works made outside the commercial frame as amateur film, experimental film, documentaries, among others, work not necessarily made to be screened in the same condition or to the same audiences. And um, this part of the cinematic heritage is often highly represented in projects as EFG, iMedia Cities. By the way, the, everyone knows iMedia Cities, yeah? We don't need to present it because I realize that we start talking. <laughs> but after I said maybe no, okay. Um, or other archival streaming platform. I mean, really, we 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 have a great diversity in the, in the kind of title we make available, and all these works reflect the richness and diversity of film production, and these from different approaches, cultural, historical, but also technological. 
for instance, in terms of sound. Silent and sound films are equally represented in a project like I Media Cities, for instance. Nevertheless, it's important to, to know that some of the silent films have new accompaniment, so they were registered as sound film, for instance. Also, the materials are almost exclusively in black and white, very exceptionally in color, and there are a few films from the early days that have color applied to the black and white emulsion. And the emulsion, then, I mean, they are also related to the genre and types of film presented in the project. For instance, we saw earlier that works produced before the 60s represent more than two-thirds of the project collection, a period in which many films were shot in black and white, although the use of the kind of emulsion also pre predominated into documentary genre, since uh, budget were usually lower. So it's, I mean, there is a reason why there is mainly black and white film, and this is, means something. The same way, the gauge of the materials are absolutely essential for historical and technical analysis of the work. 35 millimeter were generally used by professionals to be shown in cinemas. 16 millimeter, also considered a professional format, was much more used for documentaries and actualities, while amateurs uh, generally work with smaller format, cheaper and easier to handle, such as 9.5, 8 millimeter, or super 8. So it should also point it out that in um, in iMedia City there is uh, a few uh, digibeta that would become one of uh, widespread video format. Therefore, the gauge is an important source of knowledge, not only of the technological, but also the cultural, aesthetic, or industrial context of the creation of the films. And the researcher must have access to this information when they study the films. Another important aspect is the frame rate. Depending on the filming system, rates can vary between 25 frames per second for the most modern videos, the common 24 frames per second for sound cinema, or from 16 to 22 frame per second were usual, usual frame rate for silent films. And the frame rate of the work shot analog is really crucial in the reception and the experience of the film. So all these technical aspects tell something of the period, the production, the distribution. So to make film heritage available is one of the main mission of the archive. And we have to become the intermediary between analog and digital technologies. We need to translate the images to brand new and radically different language. The project to make our film heritage available online requires therefore an homogenization of the film, the codification to a standard so they can be seen in all on all kinds of devices. And in order to respect the works, analog or digital, and transmit the work in its entirety, the archive should provide the most information possible on the physical and technological aspects since they are inherent of the works. Of course, this problematic is not new. Many heritage institutions like museums and libraries face the same problematic, and many of them present detailed information on the nature of the work of which we can see a digital version. Unfortunately, this rule is not so commonly applied when it comes to films. And the physical aspect of cinema is not always reflected on commercial film streaming platforms like Mubi or Netflix, for instance. And honestly, it's really a crime to watch Interstellar on a cell phone without knowing that it was supposed to be seen 70 millimeter, no? So what about the information provided by more patrimonial websites? Well, surprisingly, they don't always make information available. <laughs> no, we just see EFG. Stop. Yeah, stop, <laughs> stop. Give give us good news. No, we. This was a decision by the whole consortium that they. Um, it was decided by the consortium to make only a few data available, but yeah. the rest is stored in the database. So it was because our works, we cannot offer this for free, and the information is so valuable. So it's a decision from the archives themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, but <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> it's, no, it's not a critical. It's, it's just <laughs> how we talk of ourselves. This is the whole question of <laughs> presentation. So, and no, but it's important because uh, the metadata that appear on iMedia Cities were processed through EFG. So there is a link. That's why also we talk of that. Uh, so uh, 
on a portal like EFG, the archive, the information, the metadata that the archive decided to provide is mainly filmographic and not technical. But it's true also that after, if we go and see other um, archival portal, um, the information can be different. So the Dutch Film Institute and Film Museum in Frankfurt, for instance, uh, don't give a link to another database where you have the technical information on filmportal.de. Uh, the same way, the Danish Film Institute in Copenhagen uh, also make a link that you can access the technical information. So it's not displayed together, but you have, you have a link. But it's true that you have to make the additional step. You have to go somewhere else. You are taken there, but you have to go. Um, other archives decided to include the physical dimension of the cinematic work together with the content, I hate this word, sorry for that, and on the website statfilm.vn.at, uh, uh, which was conceived by the Institute Ludwig Boltzmann, the Austrian Film Museum, and the Municipal and Provincial Archives of Vienna, or uh, filmarchivet.se, the common portal of the Swedish Film Institute and the National uh, Library of Sweden, uh, also communicate technical information. And in this case, it's very interesting, it's on the source element used for digitization. And we go come back to this uh, notion uh, later on. Last example, uh, the Museo Nazionale del Cinema of Tor uh, Torino, is that even communicate information on the restoration process. You have a link to the report of the restoration uh, of the film made available on Vimeo. And this is rather exceptional, I must say, the only example I found. On. So in this sense, uh, iMedia Cities could represent an opportunity to systematize and structure this information as multiple and diverse as the film element themselves. Information that can help the researcher or the common user being aware that he or she is watching a digital version or an interpretation, a translation of a physical object. And in this case, it's a 16 millimeter print. The information communicated by the institution can help creating awareness on the specificity of the work and reflecting the diversity and richness of film creation even through a unique screen on which the version we can see is unified, and therefore the user can't have consciousness of the original gauge, uh, for instance, is these are not mentioned, since the screen is the same. Aspect which is even more fundamental, since the resolution of the digital version can be confusing. Here, for instance, you have a 16 millimeter print scan in 2K versus a 35 millimeter print scan in SD. So not only is the resolution of the digitized version is absolutely not related to the original film gauge, but it's even more relevant than the original film gauge in the restitution of the work on the portal. And the different resolution and formats to be of the digitized version are related to the history of digitization projects and politics developed by the archive for more than 20 years now. The version in SD, original in many cases from older digitization project by Telecine, while the 2K or very few 4K of uh, this project, uh, 4K version originated from scan and are more recent. We would like to end with the fact that film elements used for the digitization are not always an exact reflection of the original work neither. So here we go back to the source element. Film preservation also has an history. For instance, it had been common a few decades ago for archives to duplicate silent film, which aspect ratio was 133, into sound our academy aspect ratio, which is 137. And this aspect is not related to the original elements, but to history of its dupl duplication. That's why it would be interesting to indicate the source element of the digitization, especially when, like here, the technical characteristic transmitted to the user is about the source element of digitization and not the original element of the film. You are still here? I'm not. <laughs> yeah. 
This last aspect is also important because it may influence the experience of the viewers. In the sense that some films were digitized from the original negatives, other from vintage prints that may have been screened a lot with a lot of scratches, uh, missing frames, some original from new prints. So of course the perception of the cinematic work and uh, the way researchers in this case may write on it or think of it will, will differ. This is the reason why it's important to communicate to the user and maybe even more in the frame of a research project like iMedia Cities all the information which may be useful for better apprehension and comprehension of the film in its entirety, and not only the digital version he or she accesses on the portal. To conclude, we think that archive should not give access, uh, should not only give access to film heritage, but also create awareness and consciousness. Because as we saw, the technical aspect of the filmic object are intimately related to film history, and for this reason, they always mean something. We think that in a moment when more and more films are seen on screens for which they were not conceived, the archive have a responsibility in the transmission of cinematic culture. To end, probably to share with new audiences that we want as numerous as possible through new media that we think are democratic, the film heritage we preserve with all its richness, history, and diversity may be one of the main challenge film archive will have to face the decades to come. Thank you for your attention. Maria? I just want to congratulate Camille because I come from a country where the responsible for the digital policies said he doesn't know what is film. So I thank you, Camille. I make sure that uh, this is translated and sort of graved to our uh, um, Facebook and everything, because <laughs> this is precisely what is our role. We are not just uh, digitizing uh, for the cell phones that babies can use better than us. Thank you. <laughs> Any other comment or question at the moment? Then I suggest that we go for a little break, stretch our legs, and be back in like, uh, it's now 25 past three, quarter to four, or four o'clock. Uh, Anna? No, no, less. Sure, quarter to four. We are back quarter to four here. <laughs> Okay, people, everything is over. <laughs> everything is over. <orphan. laughs> you solved the problem. <laughs> you can put it all on. <laughs> That's great. Nothing happens. <laughs> Nothing happens. Maar we wachten nog even. We wait for a few minutes. We should start again. So, uh, welcome back. And for those of you who came back to this session, you are all invited to the ACA cocktail tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so those who are not here, don't tell them. <laughs> it's at six o'clock in the Piazzetta. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, but now we go to the, uh, I, I didn't really get that. What was the, sorry? After the General Assembly. After the General Assembly, that's true, yeah. The General Assembly is in the Sala uh, Cervi, and the cocktail is in the uh, Piazzetta. Uh, but now it's to Leontine. Leontine Bout from I Film Museum, Amsterdam. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Leontine Bout. As Sandra said, I work for IV Museum. I've been the in-house lawyer for for some odd 20 years already now. And somewhere along those years, I sort of developed a pet project uh, called uh, Orphan Works. 
So no surprise, again today I'll be addressing orphan works, but don't worry, I won't bore you with any legal details as I do usually. <laughs> But I'm really here to address our fellow European archives and uh, with a plea for help, actually. Uh, we need your help to declare a lot of orphans quickly, efficiently, cheaply, and if... There we go. So why do I need your help? Um, I'm sort of single-handedly trying to clear 40,000 films uh, <laughs> that we have in our collection. And I would love to declare all the non-Dutch films orphan that we think are orphan, but I'm not allowed to. This has everything to do with how the search criteria uh, are, um, are working, and they assume that only a Danish archive can declare Danish films orphan, and only a German archive German films. So we can really realistically only declare Dutch films orphan. And we have loads of films in our archive of which I'm pretty sure that they are orphan. Uh, here's a few random examples from Germany, France, and Italy. Um, all we have really is a title and not much else. So uh, what we do know for sure is that those respective films were made in Germany, France, and Italy. But we have no production year data, we have no known makers, we have actually nothing. And I'm pretty sure every uh, one of our fellow archives um, have similar th things in their collection. And what I want to do is um, plea with you to declare them orphan without a search. No. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So what do I propose? I propose that you do a, a simple search in your own database <laughs> for all those films that you can find of which you are pretty sure that they were produced in your country. You have a title, whether it's the original one or a given one, but you have no additional data. As you have no additional data, it's really pointless to do a search because there is really nothing to search. So as far as I'm concerned, and we've done this at I, you just declare them orphan right away. You then make a simple Excel sheet, you put all the titles in, and you upload it to the OrphanWorks database of EU IPO in Alicante, and really, that's all there is to it. Now I hear you say, oops, but aren't I at a risk? What about all those 50 sources I'm supposed to consult? Aren't I in trouble? And I say, no, you are not in trouble. First of all, if anyone comes forward and claims they are the rights holder of these particular films, they have to prove it. You don't have to prove that it's orphan. They have to prove they are the rights holder. That will be very difficult for them if not impossible, because it's the kind of films, I mean, there's no reason they have no data. And furthermore, you don't have to be afraid that they can claim a ridiculous, even if they would be able to prove that they are the rights holder. The directive says they can claim fair compensation. But in these cases, for these kind of films, I can assure you, this will be zip to zero. So again, Risk? Hardly. Are there any benefits? There sure are. This is a really easy process that I want to propose to you. In fact, you don't need any legal knowledge <coughs> as such or any specialized knowledge. It doesn't involve a project. It's very low cost. It probably takes you no more than a few hours. And then there's the mutual recognition thing, which is what, what I am after, and which means really that if a film is declared orphan in one country, um, it can be used in, in all other member states as well. They don't need to do a separate search. They can use the status that you've given to that film. Now, some of you may be a bit hesitant to declare a film orphan because you are afraid it limits the kinds of uses you can make instead of expanding it. Now, again, I don't see a huge problem here. 
as commercial use, believe it or not, is not explicitly excluded in the Di Orphan Works Directive. Nowhere does it say that you are not supposed to commercially use a film. It's even better. It says you are allowed to generate income as long as you do this in order to achieve aims related to your public interest mission. Now, I don't know about how your archives are organized, but I know in the statutes of I, one of our missions is making films available to third parties for reuse. So I say, this is one of our missions, so we are covered. And so may some of you be. If you are still a bit hesitant to declare all these film orphans, there may be rescue around the corner. <laughs> As the European Commission has just issued the DSM Directive, which stands for Digital Single Market, I already quickly addressed it. And this gives, okay, the caveat here is, it works best for countries who have no collecting, collective management organization for film. So I'm guessing, Thomas, you're sort of a bit out of luck here. We are. <laughs> um, because the directive gives what it calls a fallback exception for out-of-commerce works um, that allows film archives to publish them on non-commercial websites. That's actually the only use that is allowed. So that's a bit less than um, orphan works in that sense. But if that's the only use you want to make anyhow, uh, you're fine. Um, OK, this out-of-commerce is, of course, a bit difficult in film as compared to other media. Uh, but the directive gives the member states the option to use a cutoff date to determine what is out of commerce and what is not. And in the Netherlands, our, um, our government is really far already with a pr uh, law proposal. And they want to introduce a cutoff date of, believe it or not, 20 years which means that every film older than 20 years is automatically out of commerce. Now, this, of course, would be really, really interesting. And we'll have to see if they uh, actually go through with it, because this month they were supposed to do a consultation round. And I am pretty sure that there were, are going to be some rights holders that are going to oppose to this idea. They're not entirely uh, out of the loop anyhow, because they, might, they may opt out. So even if a film is, if this goes through, is older than 20 years, you put it on your non-commercial website, a rights holder may come forward and say, I don't agree. And then you have to remove it. And the other thing is that we are now trying to convince our government to at least put in the legislation that they can't claim any compensation if they do. Because that would otherwise be, it would also be a bit tricky because then, of course, they start waiting with complaining until you put it on your non commercial website and then they opt out and say, Hi, I want some money. Um, so we don't want that. Um, there's no search required if they're going to use a cutoff date. So that's another difference with Orphan Works. Uh, you don't have to search anything. If it's older than 20 years, it's out of commerce. But what you do need to do is um, make a list of all the films that you declare out of commerce, as it were, and that you want to use. And you have to publish them on a website that has to be announced. I haven't thought about that yet, I think. Maybe it's EU IPO as well, I don't know. And um, so that also gives the, the rights holders that want to opt out at least the option to have a look and, oh, God, my film's on there. I don't want this. I'm going to opt out before they make any use. Uh, so for sure, there's going to be overlap uh, with orphan works, because anything that's orphan is, is bound to be um, out of commerce. But I think at least for like Ripriana, this would prove a big um, challenge, uh, opportunity. There's loads more films that can be used. Um, well, I'd be more than happy to help anybody <laughs> who wants to declare their half of their collection <laughs> orphan right away. <laughs> 
Uh, if you need any help, have any questions, please feel free to drop a line and I'll, uh, I'll help you out. Thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> Are there any first reactions? Does that work in your countries or archives? <laughs> as easy as Leontine is proposing it. Of course it does. <laughs> yeah, of course it's super easy. Um, hi, Thomas. <laughs> um, I'll take stage in a moment. Um, no, I think great. I love it. I've only heard bad things about the new directive, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm happy to hear someone <laughs> saying something positive about oh, it. Oh, you mean the DSM? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and and I, I would say that some of us do live with, what shall we say, creators organizations mm -hmm. who uh, object to any of what you just said <laughs> vehemently and you know threaten to burn us to hell and back again and you know uh, so so there is really an I should be careful I. You know, um, <laughs> I, I'll say this in a in a closed room. Um, there are some some right holders who strongly disapprove of anything that might, you know. So when you talk to them, uh, you know, one on one, they're like, "Oh, but yeah, that's that doesn't have work height. That's not, you know. Of course, you can use that. Um, but when it has to do with anything sort of major, which has got precedents, which has got that kind of thing, they are so dead set against it. So really what I, what I would like to hear is if there are some, um, somebody in the EU system who is pushing for this. Because that's actually something that our political level mm -hmm. and our Minister of Culture will listen to if, if there are strong forces in Brussels or Strasbourg mm -hmm. who, uh, who want to promote something like this. Because that's really what, what we need. Because otherwise, you know, eight of the 10 uh, CMOs that we have are fine with anything because mm. they can see this is this is intelligent. It's out of commerce, and two of them um, will just block anything sensible. Uh, but so so in that sense, I I would we we would need the ministry to help us, and they really don't like to deal with these guys either, and they sleep with them as well. You know, the, the, the thing is with this out of commerce, if, if there is a cutoff date, I'm not even sure that every member state is going to implement that because I think it's probably not mandatory. Um, so I was quite surprised that in the Netherlands they were uh, even considering this. And it will make things really easy. And of course, those rights holders that are still very active need not be worried because they can easily opt out. They can right away say to you, I don't want this. Don't even think about putting my stuff on a non-commercial website. So I don't th see it as a threat to them. I, um, I do foresee that they will uh, interfere with the legislation process, that they will make themselves heard to uh, uh, the respective uh, governments and say, oh, don't even think about this really short cutoff date. Um, but I think even a cutoff date of like 50 years is very workable. So I'm, I would be really fine with that. And I think that would appease most active rights holders, sort of, if it's like everything out of commerce, which is pre-World War II. I don't know. But I see it as an opportunity, for sure, and as a sort of backup plan to, to the, the orphans, although I feel that the use you can make of out of commerce is a bit more, is a bit less, uh, which is pity, but... I mean, most archives would only consider putting their stuff on their own website anyhow, so that's fine. Or on the EFG or on Arte. But that's website. a non-commercial website, so that, that is Arte that considered a non-commercial website? Uh, Arte probably not, <laughs> but EFG, yes, I think, yeah. Um, I was in a meeting organized by European Art Copyright uh, Community with one of the internal market guys from the Commission, and he said that the directive is more a framework. Mm -hmm. and that you have to implement it on member states level and that you have to first engage in a stakeholders dialogue mm -hmm. with the rights holders or the CMOs and cut off date. I haven't heard about I mean, it's a great idea. Maybe we can introduce it. But it's it. in the directive. Yeah. Huh? It's, not it's a, a possibility for cut off date. Yeah. 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 I can show you the article if, you're, yes, if you want to use it. <laughs> yeah. So we, we can try, but have, we haven't been approached by the ministry or s whatsoever. No, but like I said, I was yeah. really surprised when I heard that our, our government yeah. was, was considering that, and even such okay. a short one. I had I n never thought they would do that. I mean, they might still back out, but... Um, 
Yeah. What, what do we expect in terms of time and length of time that this directive is implemented or? Well, the, dar or the Holland is, well, surprisingly enough, I think there is a period of two years that member states can use to, uh, to transpose this into their own law. Two years, no? Yeah. Uh, but Holland, the Netherlands, is, is very, very far ahead of everybody, I think, because... That's not always the case. No, but no. That, that is another really surprising okay. thing. They want to pass it through uh, our uh, parliament in October, I think, already. Okay. So that's super, super quick. But do we advise our members to talk to their ministries, or do you yes, advise for sure. yeah, ACA yeah, yeah. to talk to rights holders? As I think if you have a direct um, link with your, with your um, respective ministries, it's a good thing to plead for a cut of date, because that would make things super, super easy. Yeah. And make sure that any claimants or, or opt-out rights holders can't claim any compensation. Perhaps we can write something in words, well, I think that was very clear to everybody, but in, in uh, non-legal terms for <laughs> all of you, mm -hmm. what to do and talk to your ministry. Yeah. And put yeah. it on our uh, website. Yeah, because they're for sure yeah. going to hold consultation rounds, I guess. Mm -hmm. They usually do. And uh, like you said, they there's a demand for a stakeholder dialogue. So, okay. Yeah. A any questions at this stage? <laughs> we can't get enough. <laughs> uh, well, no, of course I don't uh, get enough. Um, <laughs> I, I would say that um, I also, you know, I'm from the Danish Film Institute, and we, of course, also have strong departments within my institution, which sees it as their primary duty to assist rights holders, so mm -hmm. the creators, <laughs> because we subsidize and we pay for, mm -hmm. you know, 50% of what goes into Danish film production, so, mm -hmm. and we give that money away to people who we ask to exploit that money. Um, so, so I think that something, what, what I could see would be beneficial from, from the ACE is maybe you know, a, what shall we say, a realistic uh, list of suggestions for uh, implementation of the directive. Mm -hmm. So, so I would I would think 20 years is you know a no go. I think 50 50 is a good term or 70 is a good term mm -hmm. for Denmark, and that's something which for out of commerce mm -hmm. would 50 should a piece, as you say, pretty much everyone, and even that would be workable for us, because right now, de facto, we're talking about 100 years, mm -hmm. you know, between 90 and 110 years cutoff dates for public domain, and I think 50 for out of commerce would be very usable for us. So, so, so basically, I would uh, suggest that we go in and pinpoint maybe five, uh, five paragraphs in the implementation where we say, well, actually, use the cutoff date. Mm -hmm. What term it should be? You know, you decide in the member states if it's up for grabs, um, and maybe we can can say, well, this is being worked on there, and this is being worked on there. Oh. So, so I think something quite minimal is something which would be uh, workable for us, um, even though we are like five percent of the voice, um, and the others would rather like just, you know, get it over with and and uh, have it go away and then go for the beer, right? Or, or the red wine, is, there are more red wine types. But you know, th the thing is, say that, that we in the Netherlands, we get this 20 year cutoff date and it's already implemented in October. You can use that as an example for your, for your own uh, ministers and say, oh look, in the Netherlands, it's only 20 years. The only risk, of course, is that most, well, you have a big chunk of, of rights holders who will opt out for sure. So maybe it's easier to have a longer cut of date. So you have less of a contingent of opt-outers. <laughs> but I think maybe we should, if this really works really quickly in the Netherlands, we should maybe wait until we have the cut of date implemented and you can all use it as, a, as an example for your own ministries. Maybe that's an idea. Okay, thank you, it's very concrete. Uh, thank you, Leontine.
And then now will as... Be, will it be available on the website too? Yeah, we make all the, the, the presentations of today available and we will also make something that we you can use as a guide to talk to your ministry. And then now as promised earlier this afternoon, we open up to the floor and yeah. our first Thomas will explore what innovative models there are <laughs> for exhibiting and uh, distributing <laughs> film heritage. So Thomas, it's up well, to you. Well, I think that I thank you uh, very much all for coming and for staying after after coffee. Um, I think really um, in the EC we uh, we talked about uh, doing this because this is something that is, is very much at the core of uh, of what we all do is uh, how do we put films online um, and and I, I really enjoyed hearing all the speakers here uh, talking about different aspects and and I think that we um, we should and will um, explore uh, Nina's uh, talk about um, having Ate, and I think that's a very generous uh, offer to have uh, have Ate as what shall we say, throwing the weight around um, in the sense that that uh, that Ate is a professional, functional, successful um, platform, and and I've I've. Also talked to Nina in the coffee break about that. That yes, I I also share the the concerns that television, even television, even rich television, uh, is unable to uh, to show even popular films uh, because they're not the most popular films that are out there. And I think that is something that uh, that is core to us. And I'm I'm like let's throw it all online. Um, but but of course that's you also sometimes need um, to sort of be uh, say that it's precious stuff and uh, and it shouldn't just be shared uh, on pirate sites um, or or on free public sites because it's out of commerce and therefore of no value. I think that that's very much what we're what we're here to uh, to explore is also that yes it might not be commercially viable or maybe not. Have have great commercial potential, uh, the collections that that we take care of, uh, but they are of great value uh, in other ways than financial, um, and that I think is is very much what what we need to keep hammering in with our politicians, uh, maybe not our populations. They're harder to convince, maybe, but certainly our uh, politicians, and I think. Saj had some fantastic quotes earlier, um, and um, and I think that if we don't fight for culture, why why are we fighting at all? I mean, we all have a roof and uh, enough to eat and drink in this room, um, so it's really about how how we can improve our quality of life and how we can improve our population's quality of life, and not just today, but in the in the long cultural term. Um, and I have some ideas for the. Uh, for the ATSIP platform, um, but but I also uh, am happy, and I think that that yes, I do trust ATSIP, as you said, Nina, that we can trust trust each other here, and I think that that in that sense, um, for for something like that, I I would very much say that that I and we as an institution don't have we've got ideas, but we don't have the knack for exploiting like. The market, and I think there, there you have a you know a, a human human approach to to uh, what is a market, and um, and I I really hope that we manage to uh, work something out together. Um, of course, that might be in uh, somewhat competition with with EFG, but yeah. probably not. Um, I'm. I really also enjoyed Camille's talk on on the formats here, and I'm uh, you know guilty as charged. Uh, I rarely state uh, what uh, what element we digitize from. Um, we she's very kind to say that we actually display what the original format is, uh, at least on our own platform. Um, but um, but we we as you may also have. Have noticed. I come from an institution which has got a very broad scope, um, and and we're not pri predominantly a museum. 
um, and more of an institute, and therefore it is, what shall we say, we're also feeling the, the need to show numbers um, and to popularize, and I think sometimes we, uh, we uh, are, are more entertaining than, uh, than cultural, um, and, um, and that's tough, I, I'm getting old. You know, it was much better in the old days. No, I don't think so. I, I think that there, there are um, great opportunities in digital. Um, and, uh, and I think that, um, that some of the, so, so you had quite a, what shall we say? So Camille and Mayona didn't talk about the iMedia Cities um, platform as such. They talked more about specific, um, uh, aspects of it. And I would say that, that um, I think there are some here who were involved in the iMedia Cities platform, but I think one of the, one of the, the great, um, what shall we say, outcomes of that platform was that we explored the field between us as archives, between academics, um, and uh, with technology partners. And I think that is, so in that sense, the iMedia Cities project uh, showed the great potential in stretching across um, different, what shall we say, stakeholders or um, professional ways of working with audiovisual heritage. And, and I, I don't think we completely succeeded in that project, and I think that's also something that that in a sense came out in, uh, in, the, in the talk that we had here that, that Camille is sort of talking about, oh, but we want to display our collections and the material, uh, materiality of our collections. But of course, there were academics in, in the project who were interested in city development. And, and we also think that we should should address that. We should uh, make our collections available for that kind of study, and therefore, in a sense, the, the project was was very broad in scope, and <clears throat> and in a sense, the the fact that we wanted to do so much was a strength. It's probably why we got funding to do it, uh, but it's all. It also means that in almost all aspects, we can say, well, we didn't we didn't succeed. We succeeded in showing potential, but we didn't succeed in getting anything that was, you know, wrapped up nicely. Everything within a certain field uh, is now online, or it's been, you know, we have a um, what do you call it? A a core group of films that that relate to each other across all nine archives, which we have now. Um, for the 1940s, done clip analysis on, and, and we can see a development that works like this, and we can show all of these city development aspects uh, throughout this period. Um, we've more shown that that can be done. Uh, so, so in that sense, I think um, if, you're, if you are interested in the iMedia Cities uh, project, do approach it with that, with that aspect. That is not really a streaming platform. It is a platform which has addressed some, uh, a way to give uh, researchers a, a privileged access. You also have to be aware of the fact that the public platform only displays a small amount of what's in there. It only displays a small amount of the um, artificial intelligence that was applied to the films. So, um, so it's been, so it's been a great learning experience. Um, but, but, uh, but I think that uh, that most of the benefits of the project is really not publicly visible, unfortunately. But, um, but hopefully we we will manage to display that in the future. Um, and I, I think now I will, um, I would like to, uh, to hear from the floor here in a, in a sense. So, so we both have um, members of the association of uh, ACE, um, and we also have others. And, and I really what we, uh, what we, or what one of my, um, uh, ideas of having this workshop, and what I would like to, to take away here is also to hear uh, 
what your dreams as to uh, how one might go about um, accessing European film heritage uh, online in the future. Uh, because one of the, you know, so we have EFG, which was a fantastic project and which was funded at the time when the European uh, Commission and European Union uh, was, from my point of view, from a rich country, the only place that there was really uh, funding to do this kind of work with. Now I find, I mean, I'm in a very privileged position because we get if not lots, I, I, you have to be very careful about saying that you have lots of money, but, but, but we're getting ample funding to do national work, so work with national films. But the European Union uh, has, for the last seven years, so for the Horizon 2020 uh, seven-year period, uh, have cut back significantly. So basically, there used to be European money, then there was no European money, and now we have national money. And I hope that we will again have European funding so that we can, can both work in a national and a European international way. Uh, but, but in a sense, that, that funding has, uh, from my standpoint, uh, been out of sync. And that's unfortunate. And, um, and just like uh, some of the things that, uh, that Nina talked about from Ate, that, that there's this whole whole thing that everything has to be bloody useful kind of thing. It has to be useful. You have to make a 30% a um, you know, market point or something like that. And I, um, and I, I feel the same, the same way now and, and in a national way. So I, so I do feel that, that we are, in a sense, enclosing ourselves uh, within ourselves. And I think that this community uh, is one of the places where we should fight to uh, to be bigger together and that we're bigger uh, as, as the sum of all of the, all of the individual institutions than trying to make, do it ourselves. So, but do you have any dreams for what uh, the European Cinematech should be doing for the future going online, apart from talking to Ate about what will probably be a feature film masterpiece or at least only the top 20% of the films that we hold? Where's Small question. <laughs> is there a microphone still here? It's oh, coming. Oh, um, the, I don't know if it's a dream or... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so many things you said. Uh, I, I, I have ideas and I want to make reflections, but the first of all, I think that uh, this uh, idea that Nina told, and, and now you told too, that everything has to be useful. And I think that everything is useful. Uh, the fact that people doesn't watch uh, uh, European film heritage is because it's not enough available. Uh, when you put it uh, available, people are, um, of course, uh, we can discuss about the quantity of the people, but we, we have enough uh, persons in Europe who are interested by this content. Uh, and, uh, and the online consumption uh, has uh, serious surprises. Uh, last Christmas, uh, we had at the film archive in, in Hungary uh, decided to giving, uh, making a Christmas present to the uh, to the audience and uh, we put in, uh, 60 uh, films online uh, available for free uh, mainly on our Vimeo, Vimeo uh, channel uh, it restored long features short films CD uh, f footages from the early 20th century until recently so a lot of things uh, we made a deal, of course, with the uh, legal representatives of the authors, <laughs> uh, and uh, it was for 10 days. It was from 20 uh, of December until uh, 31. Mm -hmm. And uh, in one week, we got seven, uh, 750,000 uh, viewers. 
in a small country that we have. And, uh, and uh, from this number, it was uh, the, the quantity of the people who was watching uh, the whole program was uh, 120,000, which is a very good ratio. Uh, most of the program was also available uh, with English subtitle. And uh, we put it. Also, we tried to put it on uh, the international press too. So the biggest uh, numbers of visits came uh, from uh, England, uh, outside of the country, uh, from England, the United States, uh, and also from France. Uh, so I think that we have to work on to how to make it available because the people are interested. Um, and they will be more and more interested if we can argue why it's important, if we can we make, make, uh, make relationship between our uh, cinemas, our, our cinematographic cultures, our legends. We have to share legends. Because people, that's what they want to see. They don't want to see only the technical sheet. They want to know legends. They, want, they need stories. They need relationships. People who went out from this country and going to another. Why they were creative in another, in another country and not in their proper country. And, and, and so on and so on. And create, create the myth. Uh, after uh, just a very short reflection on uh, EFG. Uh, I think EFG is a, is a great, it was a great initi initiative. Uh, now, honestly, I don't know how many people is watching uh, EFG. I think maybe it's not enough if we can uh, determine what is enough. But, uh, but the thing is that putting on the website a, a, determine, a, a defined quantity of film uh, is it, it's aesthetic uh, and uh, and uh, not a dynamic uh, approach of sharing because after a certain time uh, people wants to uh, know more and more and they don't they are not satisfied uh, and if uh, the marketing uh, beside and if the content is not sustainable uh, of course people will not be there to to check what's going on on EFG. Um, so maybe the, to get life in these uh, kind of very intelligent and very nice initiatives, uh, we should find a kind of uh, solution on the data transmission uh, flow. <laughs> I don't know how to, to, to be clear on that, but I think that uh, we have all in Europe uh, a problem of uh, uh, the connection between our uh, archives uh, databases. Uh, I think if EFG could be an evolu uh, uh, on the metadata level and on that data level an evolutive uh, uh, website, it would be already a big step to satisfy the, the, the needs of the people. So maybe a new European funding would help uh, not uh, to buy again 50 uh, titles uh, or to invite uh, 50 or 100 titles for, to EFG, but to find a solution, a kind of informatic uh, development solution, how to create these uh, databases, inter-databases connection to be available to, to, to maintain uh, a, a continuous uh, diversity of, of, of the contents and evolution. I'm not sure if I was clear, but I hope. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, just a short response. Of, I think EFG would never compete with, with any sort of streaming servers like RT. Or no. It's just a very different, um, different approach. And of course, the strength is the aggregation service. It's the metadata data schema for films. It's the database part. However, I would say it's interesting content, maybe not I'm going to watch a film on EFG. It's more for researchers who want to see, OK, I have a collection of advertising films. There is another collection from the Finnish archive or from the Danish archive. So that you, it's more for research. It's less for entertainment, I would say. Yeah, but I would, yeah, but it depends on. There are people interested in these kind of documentary formats. But it's 
completely different what, from what Arte is going to propose, so length feature films. I, I totally agree. I think uh, that's why I, I, I'm, I'm saying that uh, we all have a huge quantity of information about uh, about cinema. We have, it's a it's a meta metadata factory an archive, <laughs> and uh, and like uh, uh, the metadata factory is producing new metadata, we should try to find a solution how those metadata for the research part and the research is very large because we are searching for professional reasons, we are searching for educational reasons, but also I could find, we know that even people uh, are making researches just for fun, or just for their uh, cultural interests. So it's very large. Um, so when we say research, research in, 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 in a r really big scale. So uh, that uh, that's why I totally agree with you that uh, it's not an entertainment service, but I think uh, f because of the uh, needs of the searchers, we should uh, get uh, we should get to an another step how to create the the data flows and, and making the, the metadata have more and more available and fresh metadata. And when, if we're updating something uh, in ARC, because it's a double work. Today we are working in our proper databases and we, you have EFG. Uh, if you want to update something, you have to make the, do the work two, two times. I have more dreams, not just one. <laughs> Uh, taking again what you said, I, I think, yes, it's true. We all need uh, to do an effort and going uh, again, uh, picking up the best by EFG and by iMedia Cities. I know that I, I really think they are uh, very valuable projects, both of them, different projects. And uh, what we got from EFG is, is not only is uh, we started the partnership, we, it could be forever an aggregator, and, but uh, again, we need to work and focus on uh, subjects. Why uh, uh, World War I was so successful? Because in my experience in Bologna, we work with the uh, online database. We are now very aware from the fact that when you uh, are at the end of the project and the full uh, catalog is online, you have 200,000 items uh, fully digitized, it's not enough. It's just the starting moment when you need to, to bring a, a researcher, because they are not so independent as we think they are. We need to bring them, take their, their hands, and tell them, you have to check this. Be, be, you have to start an editorial plan. You have to encourage and promote what you have online. So EFG is now at the starting point, so as other, the, cha the Chaplin Archive Online, and, and iMedia Cities is, is at the starting moment now. We really need to cross the experience together with RT, together with the, the main festival, and try to encourage new use of uh, what we have online. I, I know Europeana, I, I, I am imagining this uh, big portal as a big sea where you got lost. If, if you don't uh, do strategies uh, and there's a, a big job to do in, uh, and I think it as an edit editorial work or a curatorship work, but we need the experience of Arte and other colleagues, and we joined the effort, and we put together what we have done in uh, different moment of our common experience as film archives. And so I don't know how, but uh, these meetings here, the workshops are really useful to start thinking of something new. And I don't think we are in uh, uh, competitions, but <laughs> it's a good moment to try to, to work together with uh, the three different projects in this moment. Yeah, absolutely, and I think AC could be a good platform to either come up with topics or ideas how to integrate yeah. or these three different projects or approaches. 
Yeah, thank you. I know I just, but Matei is already coming forward. I wanted to also include, because I see a new generation of archivists sitting in the back, and I wanted them <laughs> to answer the question. And uh, I think Matei is in, in, well, yeah, that's a younger generation of archivists. What would you dream of if, if no, you answer just, Thomas's question? Uh, no, just uh, like following up on what uh, Anna said, it's, uh, there's obviously uh, the need for strong editorial and curat curatorial work on one hand, but uh, the other dream uh, I have is also uh, a sort of you know dissolution or dissolvement of a uh, uh, lot of uh, our work in the global informational infrastructure such as Wikipedia, for example. Because people don't get lost on Wikipedia. They actually, or in similar places, from my experience, they use it as their uh, means to navigate information. So uh, it's, um, I think it's uh, something that we are getting closer and closer to by uh, proper cataloging, by linked open data, by following standards, by what uh, George said about sharing catalogs. So uh, for me, the, the interesting perspective is uh, both having a, a well curated and uh, strongly editorial content that we present as if we are, you know, uh, programming a, a cinema, but then providing access to our collections online means actually, or it could mean, uh, really also dissolving them in the global informational infrastructure, which is like the internet. Okay, uh, I saw another hand being raised by a young generation. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> I'm Andrew from Montenegro in Cinematic. Uh, I can say something not only as a man from Cinematic, but uh, also as a filmmaker. Uh, EFG was very important for us, uh, especially in searching uh, World War I uh, footages. But uh, this is a really interesting and good idea or a nice dream uh, to have a unique, common, platform or channel for European films, uh, where uh, every cinematic uh, can uh, ingest uh, content, uh, namely films selected by aesthetic or historical value, and also translated. Uh, and I think, uh, potentially, it's not so small amount of spectators. Uh, but what we need is also to think about how to promote film heritage. So it's not only a question of access, of course, it's a, it's a first step, but it's also a matter of how we can reach the, the especially the younger audience, so how to, to present the film heritage. So, so it's also, for me, it's very interesting. And uh, of course, it's, it's a question of copyrights, also, we were two months ago at BFI. They, they have a lot of experience dealing with the right holders. At all, but of course, they, they put the, the films only for Britain territory platform, but it would be a big challenge how to do it across the Europe. Thank you. And I have also one question. Maybe it's much more related uh, to uh, uh, copyright legal f frame, but uh, in a situation when you have orphan work, for example, but you have some content in it uh, that has the right holders, mm -hmm. how you deal with it? Are you responsible as a cinematic if you release the film or, or put it online? Ask Maybe it's complicated. <laughs> you're always responsible for your actions. Do you but how do you deal with embedded works? I'm not sure if you mean embedded or partial orphans, because there's such a thing as a partial orphan. That means 
a film has more than one rights holder, you've located one but can't find the other ones. You still need to, you need to get the permission from the rights holder you can find or know. And for the rest, it's orphan. So you, yes, you can proceed ahead as if it's orphan, but it's called partial orphan. That what you mean, or not, or no? I th I think what you mean is if you have a film, yeah, um, for which the rights are probably orphan, yeah. but then you have sections of it, so a compilation film, so a film that contains footage yeah. which is in copyright. But then it's still partial then orphan. Because some of it is orphan and some of it yeah. isn't. Yeah, that's a partial orphan. <laughs> Which means you can't use it as a full orphan. You no, have to you clear. Have to you have to clear orphan. the specific <laughs> identified uh, copyrighted materials. You know. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, I I think that um, I mean some of the discussion we're having here is in a sense based on the difference between providing access and doing presentation of heritage. So, so and I, I think that, that EFG is very much a gateway to collections. So, so there, just like we have um, access to our collections in situ, uh, which is a, you know, a cross-European uh, right that we have, that if we have somebody who comes within our four walls, um, we can show anything in our collection to them without asking permission. Um, that's providing access, and we try, of course, uh, uh, to to provide as much access as we can in as facilitated and easy way as possible. And then I think, you know, the, obviously, film heritage can be presented to large audiences in a very successful way. I think that's exactly what happens here in Bologna this week, is that you have, you know thousands of people who come to celebrate film heritage. So, so I, don't, I don't think film heritage is dead. Um, I just think that it would be great if, uh, if we made it a bigger party than it uh, maybe is right now. And, and um, you know, maybe we're a little, um, maybe we, expect, we also expect a bit more from digital. I mean, that it liberates more because we are actually doing a lot of work um, and more heritage, I think, is available now than it ever was in easier ways. And I, I completely agree with, uh, with Camille that, that sometimes we go overboard and basically focus on pushing as much content across the, across the board as we can and forget about where it really comes from. And we're sort of like, yeah, but uh, let's, let's get it out and then we'll deal with documentation later. Um, uh, but uh, I think one of the things Andro said was about younger audiences, and I think one of the things that will be something we need to address is related to rights, which is reuse. It's also related to our own approach to our collections that, that we have in a sense well, you know, I'm, I'm one of the old archivists, I think, um, that, that we and as such, I'm sort of bridging, I think, uh, you know, the people who came before me who were hugging the collections. And, and I'm sort of like, you know, uh, I should have trained in that uh, position. At the same time, I'm also sort of partially digital native. And therefore, well, if it's free, if it's public domain, let's get it out there and let people play with it. And that's something I think that we will need to look at uh, beyond just making things available for viewing, making it available for reuse. And we can't even imagine the kind of reuse the kids that are being born today might make of our stuff. And I look forward to that day. Um, and, um, and I'm pushing that. And I hope that we can move forward both with quality, canonical platforms and, and that, uh, that more and more will be made more easily available and better searchable. Um, and I, I think that EFG has also made Google a better platform because you can find things better because of EFG on Google as well. Um, and yeah, Leontine, do uh, 
let's let's talk because it seems like you have a list that says Denmark on it as well. So I'll I'll be looking at that. Shall we close sort of all any the any last? I want to uh, ask yeah one more time for a last dream from the floor, <laughs> or a comment, or a suggestion, or something that you want ACA really to work on in the future. You can also think about it, and we share it tomorrow at the cocktail or the general assembly. But nobody else for no. Um, Nina. Yeah. yeah. Now, listening to all these very interesting and encouraging comments, from my experience as TV producer, I would say we also have to compete the fact that we are living now in a multi-screen world and that the, how should I say, the attraction to watch an historic film demands a kind of contextual knowledge on the one hand, because out of a sudden it may be quite strange and it does not interest anymore. Then another aspect is the quality of the films themselves. I guess it's getting now harder and harder um, to get attraction for historic films unless they are really good. On the other hand, we already know this canon of classical films we were just discussing. So does it always have to be Dreyer and Murnau and all the heroes? Yeah, Is there a second row that is worth to be discovered? Yes, there would be. But nonetheless, there is always this very, very fast question of quality or fastly appearing question of quality. Then another aspect is when I think watching Hungarian films, it takes some time until I get familiar with the problems of a Hungarian film <laughs> or uh, now and also with the world. So uh, how could we manage to find the perfect balance on the one hand providing contextual knowledge on the one hand, leaving and sometimes boring canon of so-called classical films that also are sometimes a bit frightening because it's the high art and people like to watch everyday films also. Yeah, So there are so many aspects all the time competing also against each other. And I can only confirm that it's really necessary to provide changing programs, um, but you have to find these themes. And it's a really uh, interesting story that you say, OK, people from the US were watching Hungarian films, maybe because they are of Hungarian origin, I would say. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But nonetheless, um, I guess one of the reasons why historical film has really um, is really competing so hard now um, is through this acceleration of time and perception and acceleration also of uh, offers that we have throughout the world. It's getting more and more harder to have this understanding for an historical film and to go in this time machine back. Yeah, And uh, a film of the 60s is sometimes very, very far away, and we don't understand why <laughs> was there uh, the problem. So how do we get this all together Yeah, to provide contextual uh, information, make a very, very good selection, really film worth to be discovered again? and discover a new quality that is beyond the academic uh, categories. Yeah. Here is in, uh, in the back from Albania. But I feel, Nina, that just in the very question you raised, there is the answer. So if there is a change that ACE with Creative Europe finds a way to talk to ministries of culture, utilizing the keyword of Europe, European identity, 
knowing that the knowledge and the art is within the archives. If you go to Mark Cousins' Scenes by Scene, the BBC thing he used to do in the 90s, so then you offer the material already ready to them. So not only do you work on the legislation, but knowing that the archive has the knowledge, has the people who can share it, you build a five minute, a 10 minute conceptual with all the knowledge this time that Camille was talking about. So you talk about the technology and the history. And then if it is really about European identity, then you do build and you tell the public TVs that this week is going to be Albania, the next month is going to be Hungary, the next month. So if, if the proposal comes so well thought out on the economical level, as well as in content, even though it is true, our pace has changed the way we look at the world, but if you give it to them already made, and they have, the, they have their own obligations to be screening things one way or another. If we find that keyword, those three lines somewhere in those EU regulations, every TV station has been signing in the past, and you prepare the material to them, why would they say no? I don't know if it's going to be in 2 a.m. again. But you can lock, I mean, it's all the picture there, it's just a lot of work. I think that's a very nice uh, last sentence. It's a lot of work. <laughs> but there's but, a lot of hope, too. And I would uh, say it's, film is also about fun. So when we leave here, let's go out and have fun with films. Uh, so we close <laughs> the, this session. Uh, I first want to also thank Anna Fiaccarini very much for all the support to ACA all the time and for uh, giving this space and everything. Uh, tomorrow afternoon there is the General Assembly from 2 to 5 at 6 o'clock because you're still here for the second session. 6 o'clock there is the ASA cocktail. So see you all tomorrow. But Thank you. No, 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 the, uh, the, the, no, not here in the... Yeah. Sala Cervi and the cocktail. Now. Thank you. It's time to run to the cinema. Huh? <laughs> it's time to run to the cinema. Then. No, it's good. Yeah. 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 Y